everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar using structural equation modeling using partial, partial least squares, uh, smart PLS. My name is Dr. Jihan Chobanolu. I know that you're coming in, uh, sorry for a minute late. Uh, we were just trying to work with technology. This is our first time using Zoom platform for a webinar. I see that uh, a lot of you are joining. It is our pleasure to welcome you on uh, to this webinar on a historic day for at least for the US, uh, probably for the entire world. As you all know, we had just the elections and uh, Donald Trump has been elected as the president of the United States. Uh, I will give a second more. I see that many people are joining in, uh, which is great. Uh, very, very happy to see all of you here. Uh, Dr. Ali and I will be conducting this webinar. Hopefully you can see us also too, but uh, as we start, I would like to go over uh, a little bit housekeeping about the, uh, the, the Zoom platform. Since you are here, you signed up uh, uh, successfully, and in your screen, either on the top or in the bottom, you should be able to see a control panel. And in this control panel, uh, you can actually um, see uh, some hands, uh, which is will look like this one. Let me see if I can bring you. Oops. Uh, you can see that there is a raised hand. If you uh, see that, it's either on the top of the screen or in the bottom of the screen. But if you do see that, uh, please click on it, raise hand, so that this way we will know that you are listening to us, you can hear us. Uh, this way, I, perfect, that's wonderful. I see a lot of hands are going up, which is wonderful. Thank you so much for letting us know that you do hear us. This is great. Uh, so with that one, I am going to uh, also tell you that in this particular panel, we have a way for you to ask questions. And here uh, are the questions. Um, again, in the, oops, I go a little bit too fast. Uh, in this one, you will be able to see again in your control panel, when you bring your mouse to the top or the bottom of the screen, it just changes from people to people, but you'll be able to see questions and answers. Throughout this webinar, if you have any questions for us, for myself or Faizan, please feel free to uh, type it here. From time to time, we are going to review them and make sure that uh, we answer all these questions for you. Um, I would like to thank the sponsors for this webinar. We have two sponsors. One is the Association of North America Higher Education International. And the other sponsor is the M3 Center for Tech, Hospital Technology Innovation at the University of South Florida, Sarasota Manatee. So I again thank both of these sponsors for making this webinar uh, possible. And also, I would like to introduce myself very quickly. My name is Dr. Jihan Chobanolu. I am a McKibben Endowed Chair Professor and the Director of the M3 Center, uh, which is sponsoring this organization. Um, and also, I, I uh, serve as the President of Association of North America Higher Education International. And also, uh, joining me today in this webinar, Dr. Faisan Ali, I will let him introduce himself. Dr. Ali? Thank you, Dr. Jihan. Uh, welcome, everybody. And considering the time zone we are in, good morning. Uh, my name is Faizan Ali. I am an assistant professor at the College of Hospitality and Tourism Leadership, which is at University of South Florida, Sarasota, Manatee. Um, though I teach marketing, but my research interests are into research methods and uh, structural equation modeling. And we thought to do this webinar to give you an introduction of this new software called Smart PLS. Thank you, Dr. Ali. And then I would like to also let you know that uh, the, the ANI, the organization uh, which is sponsoring this webinar, is uh, organizing two different conferences. The first one you see on your screen, it's going to take place in 9 to 14 April on a cruise ship. Yeah, you did not hear wrong. Yes, the conference will be on a cruise ship. This is the uh, it will be the fourth time that we are doing this on a cruise ship, even though it's going to be the seventh IBA conference. Uh, Dr. Ali and myself will be conducting this workshop on the 
uh, at the IBA conference, during the IBA conference in the conference center, of course, uh, on, during the um, IBA conference in April. It is going to be a face-to-face -face session. Right now we are doing a webinar, but that one will be. The same session will be repeated in the Glosser Conference, Global Edu Conference on Education and Research. It will, this conference will be held in 22nd to 25th, May 2017. Uh, at the University of South Florida, Sarasota Manati campus, which is where we are doing this webinar for you. If any of you were to join the, uh, one of these conferences, uh, you are welcome to attend the, the, this uh, SEM Smart PLS um, webin uh, the, the workshop in there in, in, in face to face. ANI also has two different journals. We would like to invite all of you, either you are using SEM or PLS or any other methods, we welcome uh, research articles to the International Interdisciplinary Business Economics Advancement Journal. Uh, that is, uh, Dr. Ali is serving as the assistant editor, I am serving as the co-editor. And also we have another journal that Ani publishes, which is the Journal of Global Education and Research. Um, these are all, both of them are open and, and uh, open access um, journals and they, it, which means it's free to submit or publish an article. That also means that it is free to access the published articles. ANI is a not-for-profit organization. Uh, without further ado, I would like to show you a very quickly our um, outline of the webinar. We are going to do a short introduction to SEM. Uh, we are going to also talk about the usage of SEM in different disciplines various methodological issues. We will talk about formative versus reflective constructs. And uh, we'll be showing you some examples, modeling using PLS, partially square uh, model, and evaluation of measurement model, and evaluation of the structure model. This is going to uh, pretty much give you a 30,000 view, uh, 30,000 uh, feet view of the, 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 the statistical technique and the instrument, the, the software that we are going to use with this one. Uh, before I uh, we start in this, I would like to uh, do a short poll very quickly, if you don't mind. I am going to show you a quick question just to understand all the audience that we have. What is your main area of research and or teaching? If you just please take a moment and click on one of the options. We, we are limited to eight options, that's why we had to put these. Please pick one uh, as you are seeing. So we see that almost half of you voted. Thank you so much. You should be able to see this in your screen. And please just click on it, whatever that your um, area of research and, uh, and teach or teaching. It could be different in some cases, but please pick one that, that you feel the closest to yourself. So almost everybody uh, has voted. We have few people who didn't. We'll give another two or three more seconds, and then I will close the poll, and I will show you the answers so that you also will have an idea uh, about uh, who is in the audience today, which is uh, great attendance. So I'm going to share the results with you. As you can see here, 41% uh, of the audience is hospitality tourism field. Uh, the uh, Twenty percent are in management and HR, and we have also the other areas uh, represented uh, in twelve percent in consumer behavior and marketing, which is wonderful. So thank you, and we would like to ask you one more question, uh, one more poll question, if you don't mind. And this one is going to do with something to do with the quantitative statistical methods that you use in your research. If you please take a moment again and tell us which of, you can choose more than one in this one, multiple choices allowed, because we know that you may use. Please click on, let's see, which method, statistical method, quantitative statistical method is used most by our audience here uh, who are attending the webinar. Again, I see that about uh, half of you, already more than half of you voted, which is wonderful. Please click on the uh, statistical techniques that you have used before and I will share the results with you in about uh, five seconds. Wonderful, this is great. Uh, you are a very active and interactive audience. We appreciate that. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, stop the, the polling here. 
and then share the results with you. Uh, you can see that regression, 86% of our audience here today are using regression. Um, simple or multiple regression is one of the statistical methods, quantitative. 59% uh, of you used SEM before, which is great. So hopefully some of you did, uh, did use also PLS too, but we'll introduce that to you. And then uh, the other methods are cluster analysis is not as widely used, but factor analysis is the, I, I think, number uh, two, ANOVA, and also various or ANCOA uh, is being used. So thank you again for these. That way we are going to go into our uh, webinar, continue with our webinar. Okay, so just to um, start as an introduction, I think I go a little bit too fast here. Okay, um, with the first uh, generation statistical methods, the general assumption is that the data are error free. This is the main difference between the first generation statistical methods, which are multiple regression, logistic regression, one and zero, yes or no kind of questions, analysis of variance, cluster analysis, exploratory factor analysis, and multidimensional scaling. These are the regression-based approaches and only accounts for the observed variables. Uh, what that means is that you are not going to uh, predict or see the ones that, that we don't observe. But in the second generation statistical methods, on the other hand, the measurement model stage attempts to identify the error component of the data. That is probably one of the biggest. Uh, in the, the, the model, uh, the method that are using the second generation statistical methods is uh, the structural equation modeling, as you all know, and more than half of you have used this already, either the covariance-based uh, structural equation modeling or partially least squares uh, structural equation modeling. So knowing this, uh, we would like to talk a little bit about the measurement error. Measurement error, as you probably know very well, is the difference between the true value of the variable and the value obtained by using scale. The types of measurement error can be summarized in two different categories. Random error can affect the reliability of the construct, or which is even more dangerous, the systematic error can affect the validity of the construct. Um, you can see that we have some uh, references here. And some of the sources of this error could be the poorly uh, worded questions in survey, which is the reliability uh, impact, right? That's why we do the pilot studies and to make sure that the questions that we ask are understood the same way by all participants. Uh, another reason of the error could be the incorrect application of statistical methods, which uh, we are going to talk a little bit about this one in this webinar. The other part, and of course, the misunderstanding of the scaling approach could be the another reason, uh, source of the error in this particular context. But we are going to um, uh, focus on the incorrect application of the statistical methods. So, let me go in here, yep. Structural equation modeling um, is an advanced statistical tool used to assess complex models with many relationships perform confirmatory factor analysis and incorporate both unobserved and observed variables. This is the biggest difference. It combines the characteristics of factor analysis and multiple regression. As you all know, if you don't use SEM, you do a factor analysis first and you take all these factors that come out of the factor analysis, then we put them in multiple regression as our independent variables. Of course, we have a dependent variable, but we can, in the multiple regression, we can uh, measure this only with one dependent variable at a time. If you have more than one dependent variable, you could actually do it uh, independent, a different multiple regression analysis to be able to do this. But in SEM, you can combine all of them and also you'll be able to add more than one uh, dependent variable into the model. It's largely used in various academic disciplines over the last decade, uh, SEM. There are two approaches as we have mentioned before. One is the covariance-based SEM, and the other one is variance-based uh, SEM, which PLS, uh, partial recurs SEM, is part of it. That is the, uh, the focus of this webinar. We are going to show you how to use this uh, method and by using Smart PLS, which is one of the software used in this particular, uh, uh, in, in this particular tool. 
Okay, I will go to, I just want to show you quickly uh, some articles that are some of the scholars have actually conducted some survey articles, the use of either the SEM, structural equation modeling, or uh, PLS-based uh, SEM. So, uh, Deval and uh, Asseker just did this in 2016. This is a brand new article in the Journal of Travel Research. They have talked about this, uh, partial least square structural equation modeling. And then uh, some of the more examples here uh, is the use of partial le least square path modeling in international marketing. This is another article that focused on, uh, again, PLS, but in a different discipline. And I assume that some of you are uh, in this particular field. Or also in MIS, MIS quarterly published an article in 1995, which is kind of like the beginning of the use of the structural equation modeling. I mean, when I say beginning, of course, it, it has been in existence uh, since 1950s, 60s, but uh, it has been started to use more mainstream. And they also talk about um, the, the use of usage of this. With that one, uh, you can see here, with, there's, if you were to go to Google Scholar, if you just put uh, the use of SEM, put a discipline that you want, uh, you'll be able to find a lot of things. I just wanna pay, uh, bring your attention to here, uh, famous uh, Dr. Hare, uh, his article here, actually chapter, the book, uh, Primer on Partial Least Squares, Structural Equation Modeling has been, even though it was published in 2016, it has been cited more than uh, 1800 times. And there is business research, international business research, and all different fields. There's a lot of studies has been done to see the use of SEM in different disciplines. And the software that, that you can conduct SEM is, uh, as we have said, covariance-based SEM versus PLS-based uh, SEM. The, the, the top, the red ones that you see, there's many different software. It's just like a, a type of car, Honda, Toyota, Ford. This is EMAS, Lisrael, M+. On the other side, on the PLS, it's Smart PLS, which is the focus for today. Uh, by the way, neither Dr. Ali or I are connected to Smart PLS in any other way. It is a tool that we use in our research. We like it. That's why we decided to share our knowledge and experience with you. PLS Graph and PLS uh, GUI. Uh, none of these, to our knowledge, maybe uh, we may be wrong, but none of them are actually um, actually uh, are free. Uh, there is two questions. Somebody asked if the presentation will be available after the webinar. Yes, we are recording this webinar and we are going to post this on our website and we are going to um, do it also too. And we're going to take the other questions in a second uh, as well. Okay, in the hospitality research, as you can see here, um, quite a few uh, articles are using SEM in hospitality field. Uh, but if you were to look at over here, you can see the partial least squares in the graph over here, the proportion of the CB base versus the PLS base, you can see that uh, PLS base is still in a minority in terms of the uh, tool as uh, used to, to, to conduct SEM studies. Some of the main usages of SEM in hospital research are uh, on the right corner here, aspects related to causality, co uh, causality, testing complex models, having mediating and moderating effects, 45% of them, and 13% of them used uh, SEM for scale development. Uh, and then this is again another research in 2016. This is in the international business research. You can see that uh, covariance-based SEM is predominantly more than the PLS-based. In this particular uh, study, uh, Sinkovics and et al. have found that 379 um, of the studies use CB-based uh, CB SEM, only 45 of them use PLS. This is just one another example that, but it is growing uh, every single day. Uh, this is another quick statistics for you that shows the use of SEM in business analytics journals. As you can see, 19, after 1994, the use of SEM is boosted. In 2005, more than 4,000 articles have been using this. Um, uh, we have one more quick poll for you here. I'm gonna just start that one. If you please uh, tell us what you think about this. 
uh, I'm going to launch the, the poll. The question is that if you please indicate if you use coefficient based SEM versus partially least square based SEM, please tell us what you have used uh, or both whatever that you may have used. Maybe some people have a preference for one or the other, but uh, in this webinar, we're gonna to explain to you, actually, the, the, some of the good reasons why you could potentially use PLS as well. So please vote quickly, just choose one of the options. Wonderful, I'm gonna give another second here. Okay, and I'm going to end the poll. And then I'm gonna share the results with you. 42% um, of you did not use SEM before, which makes it great for you to be in this webinar and 37% of you use uh, uh, covariance-based uh, SEM. Only 6% of you use um, PLS-based, and 15% of you use both, which is great. Again, it makes a wonderful um, crowd for this webinar, and hopefully we'll be able to help the one, those of you who did not use or uh, before this one. Okay, um, I'm gonna switch to Dr. Ali soon, uh, but let me just cover a couple of uh, more slides. I just go a little bit too fast. Sorry about that. We are trying to work through this technology here. I apologize for sometimes advancing the slides without uh, wanting it. Here, uh, some of the main differences between the PLS-based uh, versus covariance-based uh, SCM is that the objective in the PLS is predict prediction-oriented. In the covariance-based is the parameter-oriented. In the approach is variance-based in the PLS, in the CB, just the name says covariance-based, obviously. And if you look at some of the other areas here, you can just look at this. But one big criticism for the uh, PLS is the last one, as you can see here, the goodness of fit. In this one, in this uh, covariance-based, it is established. This is one of the things that I'm, I'm editor of multiple journals. Uh, I know that our reviewers, when they got an SEM, they want to see the uh, goodness of fit metrics. This is how they immediately be able to evaluate the fit of the model. But in PLS, this is being developed and discussed. It's not there. Okay, now I would like to switch to Dr. Ali first to uh, see if there's anything else he wants to add to this slide and then carry on uh, and show us how to use PLS uh, with some examples and smart PLS to software. Dr. Ali? Thank you very much, Dr. Jihan. Um, uh, it was well done, like the initial parts and the introduction and everything. So um, all, all of the things in terms of introduction, you have covered them all. I just wanted to explain a few more things, uh, like you were explaining about PLS and then smart PLS. So I just want to clarify that PLS is an approach and smart PLS is an instrument or an application to carry that approach. So. Again, we just want to clarify that neither me nor Dr. Jehan is affiliated to Smart PLS in any way. Uh, it's just one uh, software we are using. But if you understand the concepts for PLS, you can uh, use any other software of your choice to conduct PLS analysis. So um, with all these differences between PLS and CB, uh, CBSEM, uh, I just wanted to highlight some of the methodolo methodological issues which are in the usage of SEM. Now from the poll results, um, we saw that there are around 37% people who have used CBSEM only for their research. Um, but when you look at other research conducted like review papers done on the usage of SEM, there are certain problems with the usage of SEM. And one of those papers was recently published in Journal of Travel Research, which was done on usage of SEM in tourism research. So these are something, uh, some of the methodological things which are important to consider, but people do not do that. So first of all, it's about the sample size. So we have seen that many, many people have used CBSEM, or I can also say that many people have used AMOS uh, to do CBSEM. Now, uh, here's one other thing which I wanted to uh, highlight that in the literature, since many people have been using CBSEM, 
they normally use SEM to portray CB SEM, which is wrong because SEM has two approaches and PLS SEM is equally as important as CB SEM. Uh, so uh, whenever you see most of the people say we have used SEM, you will see that majority of them are actually using CB SEM, which is covariance based SEM. So um, when we look at the usage of SEM, we see that uh, since it's a covariance based approach, it normally requires a larger sample size in order to have model fit statistics, uh, acceptable model fit statistics. Uh, but people use SEM or CB SEM without considering the sample size. Um, uh, a general rule of thumb is that you should have at least 10 respondents for each item in your questionnaire. Again, it's a general rule of thumb. There are other uh, formulas which you can employ to find out your sample size required to run a model. But uh, for being an editor and um, uh, assistant editor for a number of journals, we have realized that quite a lot of people these days use a sample size of like 200 to 300 respondents and then their models are very complex uh, which result in problematic uh, findings. So this is one issue which is normally ignored by the researchers. The second one is model complexity. Now since AMOS is really sensitive to data or uh, as a software and people use AMOS to conduct covariance based SEM, we have seen that sometimes they would use really complex models uh, uh, to be run based on CP SEM. Again, the result is that you don't have uh, proper findings, you don't have a good model fit, and you have to delete a lot of items. So this is another consideration. The third one is that you would have seen that sometimes when you are doing your research, like a research problem or your thesis or dissertation, normally we have one dependent variable or two dependent variables, and our research problem is uh, revolving around prediction. So we just want to, for instance, if somebody is conducting a research on customer loyalty, so the research problem normally would be we want to see what are the factors that determine customer loyalty. So in this case, your research problem is actually prediction based uh, and uh, people use uh, covariance based SEM to find out the results for prediction based modeling, which is again a, uh, an error. Uh, and that's the error what Dr. Jehan was talking about in the start that uh, this error creates a lot of problems in our analysis. Um, whenever you have these prediction-based modeling uh, models or prediction-based research uh, questions, it's always recommended to use PLS because PLS is a prediction-based analytical tool. Uh, four, which is extremely important, is data normality. Now, uh, CB SEM or covariance-based SEM, it is a parametric data analytical tool, which means that you must have your data normally distributed in order to conduct your analysis. However, um, you can even do it by yourself, like you can go to any of the journals you normally use to download papers or to read papers, you can go, you can do a normal survey, just download 10 of the papers which are using SEM and see how many of them uh, actually conduct and report data normality. You will see that hardly one or two of those 10 papers would be uh, reporting data normality. Again, this is just an average based on my experience in some fields you might find people who are doing it and in fact in our tourism the top journal which is tourism management if you go to their website and if you look at the guide for authors or guide to authors you will see that now they have made it mandatory that if you are using SEM you should report and provide the statistics related to data normality um, in some of the models with increasing quantitative analysis usage, we see that people are using formative constructs or single item constructs. We have seen that people have used these type of constructs while modeling in CBSEM. Again, this is an error because an assumption for conducting CBSEM is that since it's a covariance based, covariance means you should have at least two items in, in order to covary them but still people use single item constructs to do CBSEM, resulting in problematic findings. Uh, so that's another methodological issue which normally is ignored by the researchers who use CBSEM. And the last one is weak theoretical support. Now we know that whenever you are doing your PhD or some uh, you know, groundbreaking research, uh, you do not have a very strong theoretical support. And in that instance where you do not have a strong theoretical support, you cannot use covariance-based SEM because covariance-based SEM is uh, 
drawn based on a very strong theoretical support. So you can only uh, run your analysis uh, on CB, SEM if you have a strong theoretical justification. But if your research is exploratory in nature, or for instance something which is very new, like uh, let's say these days on sharing economy, there's not a lot of research being done. Uh, people are working on it these days, but not a lot of published research is there. In that type of case where you have weak theoretical support, you cannot use CBSEM. Uh, people did it, but it again results in bad findings. So these are some methodological issues which are normally ignored uh, while using SEM. And I wanted to highlight this because I'm going to introduce PLS as an alternate to these type of issues which people normally have. So um, PLS SEM, it normally, as I said, it focuses on prediction um, of certain variables where, where you have these certain variables. Uh, all right, so uh, what it, it's again, there is no proper uh, difference in PLS SEM and CB SEM in terms of the running the analysis because it's both of them are uh, approaches to SEM, so it's, it's almost identical. It's just the philosophy and the algorithms on the back which are different. So a PLS SEM, just like CB SEM, it, full, it, it has to have certain hypothesized relationships and it tests those relationships, but the entire focus is on the explained variance of the dependent variable. And that simply means that if your research problem is to have to focus on R square in your model, which is your predicted variable, uh, then you can use uh, PLS, which is a very wonderful uh, approach to SEM. Now, these gentlemen in the picture, these are the authors to this wonderful book, which is about uh, PLS, uh, SEM, and it's published in 2016. And you can um, imagine how, um, how good this book is, because uh, even though it's published in 2016, they've already uh, captured around 1,900 citations. Um, now, Smart PLS was a software, as I said, which was developed uh, by the, the German, um, uh, German gentleman called Christian Ringel uh, in 2005, and since then they have improved it considerably. Um, if you guys know statistics, you know that Joseph here, one of the uh, fathers of modern day multivariate analysis, data analysis, uh, he has this quotation about Smart PLS, and he says that it's a revolutionary software. Uh, which has the state-of-the-art methods and uh, easy and very intuitive graphical user interface. And I'm going to show you and you will love it because my experience, I've been conducting these workshops and I have not seen a single person who did not fall in love with the interface of Smart PLS. And that's the only reason why I also use it because it's so good, it looks good, and it's so easy to conduct your SEM analysis with that. So um, now, yeah, this is one issue that whenever you are using PLS, there's a huge chance that you might be grilled by the reviewers or by the editors or sometimes by even your examiners or committee members that why have you been using PLS or you might even get some very harsh comments from them. But fear not because uh, people who love PLS, they are working on them. And I just wanted to show you the presence of PLS SEM into the literature and you can see the first article published in 2011 cited more than 2400 times um, the second article cited 2800 times and uh, published in 2009 and all of them are like top journals uh, those of you who know marketing you know that how prestigious journal of academy of marketing sciences so we have all these papers being published in these top journals um, in fact there's a link uh, when you get these slides, you can go on this link and you can check one of the best journals for uh, supply chain management and business is Long Range Planning, published by Alisphere. And if you go to uh, the section where they have the most cited articles, you will see that they have top most cited articles, top five most cited articles, and all five of them are related to PLS some in some way. And that shows that how important it is becoming to understand PLS SEM. Um, now, um, there's a way to track the papers which are using PLS in, into their analysis. And if you look at the growth, it's tremendous. And it's amazing to see that how many people are now using PLS every year. Uh, again, uh, for those of you who are in hospitality, I would say that it's not really good. Uh, it's really a low number uh, of researchers who are using PLS. And I'm working on a 
on, on different papers to, to highlight the advantages of using PLS into hospitality and tourism research, but overall in marketing research or in international business or in some other fields like family business research, those type of things you can see uh, the numbers are like going really high uh, in terms of PLS usage. Now, um, uh, since as I said, you know, whenever you are using PLS, you should be aware that you might get grilled. That is why it's really important that you understand why you are using PLS and there are justifications for using PLS. Again, when I'm uh, explaining all these benefits, it does not mean that you should just go and start using PLS until and unless if you have justification for that usage. And this justification can be on different type of levels. So the first level, as I said, like when you start your research, it would be your research problem or your research question. So let's say if your research problem is related to um, research predicted variables, right? Uh, so if your primary objective is prediction and explanation of target constructs, you should not think about anything else. You should just pick up PLS and start using it. Secondly, uh, if you have smaller sample sizes, we know in instances like data collection is expensive, it's hectic, it requires a lot of effort. And even if you have a large data set, sometimes it's so problematic that you have to delete a lot of things from your data set, um, which results in a smaller uh, usable sample at the end of the day. Now, when you have those type of scenarios, you can go with PLS. Uh, Remember, I'm not saying that you should uh, you should just collect a smaller sample size to go and conduct research on PLS. Uh, try to collect a larger sample data sample. It's completely okay. PLS produces good results with larger sample sizes. But in case where you have a smaller sample size, uh, PLS produces a very good result as compared to covariance-based SEM. So that works very well. Uh, the third is complex models. Now, a rule of thumb for CBSEM. Uh, and AMOS basically is that uh, it works very well if you have a number of constructs from somewhere three to seven. So if your model have like three, four, five, six, or seven variables, you are good to go with AMOS. But if you have more than that, or let's say if you have um, uh, multiple med mediation or moderated mediation or you know multiple DVs or multiple IVs, stuff like that, which really complicates your model, then AMOS will really be sensitive to that model and you might not get model fit statistics. In that case, PLS again is a wonderful choice to go with. And when we go to do these practical examples, you will realize that how easy it is to model on PLS and to run those and, uh, run those models. Now, uh, PLS is a non-parametric uh, research uh, analytical tool. So if your data is not normal, you can go with PLS. Um, again, if you have any questions related to these things, you can put your questions. We'll see, as soon as I'm, I'm done with this, we'll try to answer your questions in order to clarify any confusions that you might have. Um, when I'm talking about normality, we talk about, uh, in social sciences, it's hardly possible to get a normally distributed data set. I have been asked by people that even you have non-normal data, you can standardize that data to make it normal. But my answer to all those is that that is sort of data tampering because you are doing some sort of stuff to that data to make it normal. Um, and that's sort of tampering the data. That's my approach towards it. Again, there are people who would be against this approach and there are people who would be for this approach. Uh, and I don't want to go into that discussion considering the limited time, of course. Uh, but if uh, somehow you can reach me through email, I will be glad to answer your questions again. Now, um, uh, again, one other benefit of PLS with increasing modeling in the research these days, it supports single item constructs as well as reflective and formative constructs. Now, again, if you have formative constructs, AMOS cannot handle it or CBSEM cannot handle it on larger levels. So if you have these complicated models with reflective and formative and or single item constructs, PLS can handle them very well. Um, if you have, as I said earlier, if you have weaker theoretical support or if you are integrating multiple theories, which is sort of exploratory research, Again, PLS would help you with that. And yeah, the last one, if you have ordinal and binary scale questions, PLS works with both types of scale questions. So these are all justifications. So if you are using PLS, uh, you should be prepared to use these justifications in your methodology part to say that what are the reasons which 
push you to use PLS instead of covariance-based SEM. And uh, believe me that if you do not do that, the editor or reviewer is going to ask you to put that in your manuscript or in your thesis or dissertation. So uh, with all this, I just wanted to say uh, a few more things and then we can go into the practical examples. And these things are going to help you because uh, I did not really see a lot of people doing these things when they are using SEM. Now remember, if you are using CBSEM or PLSSEM, it's always recommended to do these steps before actually you go into your deep data analysis. First of them is missing data. Uh, we all know that we don't want missing data into our data sets, but then again, it's impossible to get a data set which has no missing value. You might get it sometimes, but usually you do not get any data set with no missing values. So when you have missing values, there are certain uh, rule of thumbs and I've put them here on the PPT for easy understanding. So let's say if you have one response, like one questionnaire and more than 25% of data is missing, you shouldn't use that questionnaire because it has serious troubles with um, the data validity and reliability. Um, then if let's say you have, uh, if you look at the entire data set and for each variable, if you have less than five, more than 5% value missing, you should delete that uh, indicator. If not, let's say if you have less than 5% values missing in any of the variable, of course you shouldn't delete that, but then you have to fill in some those missing data points because if you are using PLS, you should, uh, PLS does not accept any missing data points. So let's say if you have any missing data points in your data set, there are three ways to do it. One of them is use the midpoint of the scale. So let's say if you're using um, uh, a five point Likert scale, you can put either two or uh, uh, three in all those missing data points. That's the midpoint of your scale. So that's, it, it's just to make sure that you are not skewing the data in any way. The other one is mean of the respondent. So let's say if there is some missing data points, you, look, you take the mean of the entire questionnaire, like the entire variable, and you put that mean value into the missing data points. And the third one is expectation maximization. This is a statistical method, which can be done with SPSS. And I'm not gonna go into that because that's a separate analytical tool. Um, we'll look into that. I mean, you can look into that. If you go to YouTube, there are a bundle of videos explaining how to conduct expectation maximization. Now, um, there's also cases where people do not respond to the entire construct. So let's say if you have a construct called customer satisfaction and you have three or four different questions to uh, get data for customer satisfaction. And if somebody didn't answer all of them, obviously you do not have data for that construct. So you, you have to delete that construct. Um, that's the way it is to be done. Um, and another thing which is really important and in statistical term, we call it unengaged responses. And that's where you give somebody a questionnaire and without reading, they just take three, 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 or four, four, four for everything. Um, so those are suspicious response patterns. Or, so if you have those type of things, you have to remove those responses. Uh, and I'm saying this because it's getting increasingly important to clean up your data before actually using that data for analyzing it further. Um, and the second thing which is really important is data normality. Again, I said, uh, if you are using CBSEM, it's a must to do data normality analysis and actually report that in your manuscript. If you are doing PLS, it's not necessary to do it, but because it's a justification for using PLS. So obviously it's logical to conduct data normality and then say that my data set is not normal. That is why I'm using PLS. So again, it, re it, it just reinforces my stance of saying that if you are using any type of SEM, it's important to report, conduct and report data normality. Uh, there are certain ways of doing that, but the easiest way of doing that is to look at skewness and kurtosis. Um, I assume that uh, with the statistics we had for people using quantitative analysis and like 86% of the, you know, the, the, the people who are attending to, they have been using regression analysis. Uh, I assume that you know what skewness and kurtosis is. Just for some students who might not know, um, the, the, the rule of thumb is that your skewness value should be within plus minus one. Uh, kurtosis should be within plus minus, some people say three, some people say five, some people say seven. Again, a literature is a, you know, there's a large body of literature and people have been like giving all these th different types of, you know, uh, statistics about them. I normally use plus minus one for skewness and plus minus uh, two for kurtosis. 
uh, but and that's stricter just to make sure that you know data is uh, really normal uh, you have other statistics and you can use them if you can find them within the literature so um, just to conclude whenever you are using SEM it's important to do both these things a report conduct missing data analysis and data normality so um, being said that I'll, I'll, I'll just jump to PLS SEM Dr. Ali? Um, Yes, Dr. Can, can I can I just like jump in for a second? There are a couple of questions yep. that I would like to take a time to make sure that our uh, audience get the answers. Several people asked me if we are going to make the presentation available mm -hmm. uh, after the webinar. We will be happy to do that. When we email you, not only we're we going to email you the link, which is going to be at the end of this also presentation, but also give you the uh, the, the slides that we are using in this uh, one. Okay. And one person asked about, will you talk about uh, covariance based SEM in the future? This is something that we can definitely uh, discuss with Dr. Ali and, and uh, we'll be happy to try to do a webinar on that one. And there is another question, uh, Dr. Ali, maybe uh, you can address this one. What is the difference uh, among SEM, mm -hmm. vector autoregressive model and VEC? Sorry, I didn't get you. Uh, your voice is cutting off. So you said, what's the difference between SEM? What is the difference among SEM, mm -hmm. comma, vector autoregressive model? Okay. And VEC, vector. Okay. Okay, uh, so Dr. Jian, I'm going to answer that, but I just want to go through this PLS because, okay. you know, this uh, webinar is about that. I'm going to answer that, but I just want to make sure that I do the practical examples before Perfect. we run out of time. Perfect. I don't want to disappoint all the people who came for, you know, this uh, practical example. No, no problem. But in the end, if we have uh, time left, I'm going to answer this question. Wonderful. Thank it, you. Takes, it would take time to explain those differences between these analytical tools. Okay, and yeah, one more thing to add, uh, we will not only uh, make available the presentation and the video, but we are also going to send you a couple of research papers, uh, those papers who are, which are published in good journals and they have reported all these things which I'm talking about. So that gives you an idea of how actually, how to report these things which I'm like telling you about missing values and data normality and sample size and everything. So that can help all these participants. Okay, so um, with um, said, being said that, uh, let's go ahead to PLS. Now PLS, same like CBSCM, we have two, two different uh, uh, steps to conduct the PLS part model assessment. So the first one, um, which uh, forgive me, and uh, it is just miss, you know, it's just like change the space. So the first one is actually the measurement model. Uh, which actually looks at the relationship between the construct and the indicator variables. And the second one is structural model, which looks at the relationships. So I'm just going to quickly draw here something and uh, try to explain what I'm talking about. So if you know, normally we have like this type of a model. Sorry about my terrible drawing. So let's say if we have this as a satisfaction, loyalty. So yeah, I'm, I'm again, sorry about my terrible drawing, but we don't have, you know, really advanced technology to do these type of things. So uh, let's say if we have this model, which talks about relationship between satisfaction and loyalty. So for satisfaction, obviously we'll have three questions in the questionnaire for loyalty, we'll have different questions in the questionnaire and that's our data right so when we are doing PLS it's just like any normal day so let's say um, if you have to drive from your home to your office in the morning or to your school or whatever so before you start the car you actually look if you all the tires are okay if you have enough fuel in the car if the car starts only if all those things are okay then you drive from your house to your office or your workplace or wherever you are going it's the same thing here so Whenever we have this model, our main goal is to look or test the hypothesis between the variables. So in this case, let's say we have to test the hypothesis between satisfaction and loyalty, right? Uh, before we test this hypothesis, we need to make sure that satisfaction and loyalty are both valid and reliable. And how we do that, we do that by 
we do it by checking how good are our measurement items and how well did people answer those questions in the questionnaire. So statistically, when we are checking this variable and the items, that's our measurement model because we are talking about the measurement scales here, right? And once everything is okay on this uh, level, then we go to the next level, which is looking at the relationship between variables, which is your hypothesis. And since hypothesis develop the structure of your model, that's why we call that one as structural model analysis. So this is a basic explanation of PLS SEM, which in general is like this. So, um, all right, now if we look here, uh, all right. Okay, so if we look here, this is a model which is drawn in, uh, which is actually drawn in smart PLS and we are going to work on that later on. But um, I don't know if you all can see the mouse on the screen. Uh, if you can see that, uh, you, you will look at these blue rectangles or blue ovals actually. This would be the oval shape. Yeah, the blue ovals, these are your constructs, which is your main variables. So these relationships or the arrows between these blue ovals, these are your hypotheses. Right? And this is actually your uh, structural model. So if you look at the box, which is around these blue ovals, it shows that's your structural model. And then uh, these yellow uh, rectangles, these are actually the items, the items you have in your questionnaire and you put them and then people read them and give you answer for that particular question. So here you get the data for each of this question. Now, obviously this blue oval, it's measured through the data for these three uh, yellow rectangles. And here is what we call as the, the measurement model. So that's your measurement model. Now, obviously, we have different type of constructs, reflective, formative. I'm going to go into that very soon, and I'll tell you. But normally, when we have the statistics, so all the numbers which are for measurement model, we call them as loadings. And all the numbers for the structural model, we call them as path coefficient. So that's, that's a very basic explanation of how a smart PLS model looks like. Uh, now, if we go to the next slide, we are going to talk about reflective and formative. And I'll say why this is important to understand. Because this is the main conceptualization of your variables, right? Now, um, here, uh, there's a very basic difference between reflective and formative. But when I say basic, that's in terms of understanding, okay? But your decision to say that this construct is reflective or formative, it is not clearly defined in literature. Uh, and it's always difficult to decide whether this variable should be reflective or this should be formative. There are certain guidelines um, in the literature. We have to look into them. But an easy explanation of this would be that when a item, when a construct is reflective, it simply means that all these items they will reflect the meaning of the construct. So here the example shows like if you want to see timeliness, right? So if you have a friend or if you have a colleague or somebody and you want to see if that person observed timeliness, you will have to see that whether he accommodates last minute requests, whether he has punctuality in meeting deadlines, whether he has speed of returning phone calls or emails. So all these three things actually reflect timeliness. That's what it means. Whereas for formative, it means that all these three items, they form that variable. They develop that variable. So let's say if we have to look at life stress, so we see what forms the life stress. It would be job loss, divorce, and recent accident, right? Now, these, this is a very basic differentiation. But remember that since for reflective, these items all reflect the same thing, right? There should be high correlation between these items, very high correlation, because all of them are reflecting the same thing. Right? So that's why even if you have to delete one of them, the rest of them will still show timeliness. Right? But for formative, it's different because all these three things are different, like job loss, divorce, recent accident. These are all three different things. Right? So, if, so the correlation between these items shouldn't be very high because these are all different variables, different things, very different from each other. So here what happens is whenever you have a formative construct, you cannot delete 
one of these items because if you delete one of these items then the concept of this whole variable changes so let's say we um, delete x1 which is job loss right and then we still have divorce and recent accident maybe these two de develop something else not life stress maybe it's something like personal life stress not life stress personal life stress because still you have your job so on the work and you don't really have work life stress something like this so again you might feel a bit difficult to understand this but that's exactly what i said that even literature says that in order for you to decide which construct is reflective or which is formative it's not clear cut it's a bit difficult to understand that but uh, what happens is that the next question people ask is how do we make sure that uh, uh, something is uh, uh, reflective or something is formative that is based on literature so if you are picking up a construct from the literature literature should have actually defined whether that's a reflective paper, uh, construct or a formative if it's not in literature then there are certain guidelines and you have to follow those guidelines but again that's a separate topic it's not part of pls it's a separate topic and i hope that in the future when we do this live sessions of this workshop um, I end cover this because it's really difficult for me to explain this complicated stuff to online channel. It's, it's because I can't draw anything here. Now, um, all right, uh, so here I just got one question and this question is about sample size. Somebody is asking that what is a small sample size? Is it under 200 or under 100? Just want to answer this question very quickly. Sample size is a relative term. We cannot say what is a small sample size or what is a large sample size. For instance, if you are, uh, let's say if you have to conduct a research and you want to do a research on restaurant owners, or ethnic restaurant owners in Miami, right? So maybe 200 is a large sample because you might not have that much restaurant owners. Maybe you have 500, maybe you have 600. So in that case, 200 is a large sample size. But let's say if you want to conduct a research on user satisfaction of iPhone, satisfaction of iPhone users in Miami, then 200 is a very, very small sample size because you have a very large population. Okay, so it's really a relative term. We can't say what is a small, what is a large sample size. That's why people actually relate it to, um, to the number of items on your question. So, uh, again, um, um, so we have a few uh, questions. I'm, I'm going to skip the question for a little while so we can go into the modeling part so we can, you know, go with the flow of the uh, flow of the presentation. As soon as I finish with it, I'm going to answer all your questions, uh, time permitting again. So here is reflective and formative. Um, now I just want to go ahead very quickly and tell you that when we are doing measurement model, it's actually to see the reliability and validity of the construct measures. Uh, as I said, you want to make sure that the data you collected for each construct should be reliable and valid. For reliability and validity, we have different uh, criteria. So for reliability, normally people say you should use Kronbach Alpha. Traditionally, people would use Kronbach Alpha. Uh, again, literature has different type of uh, cutoff values. Somebody says 0 0.6, somebody says 0 0.7. Uh, with PLS or uh, when we use PLS SCM, uh, it's always recommended to not use Kronbach Alpha, but composite reliability because of the uh, benefits it's bring and because of the accuracy of the findings or results, uh, it's always recommended to use composite reliability instead of Kronbach Alpha. Uh, again, if you are doing CFA, the cutoff value for composite reliability is 0 0.70, which is your item loadings. Um, and then if your research is sort of exploratory, not really confirmatory, then still there is a chance you can go down to 0 0.6. Some people even say that even if your loadings are around, if your composite reliability is around 0 0.5, it's still okay. Uh, again, it's literature. You can find different type of cutoff values. Indicator reliability. So the first one, which is composite reliability and Kronbach Alpha, it's for your construct, let's say satisfaction. So it's for your overall construct. Uh, and then when you look at the individual items, like each question in your questionnaire, there we use indicator reliability and that's your item loading. Now for item loadings, uh, people say 0 0.7, I'm gonna cover it in the next slide. Uh, 
I say it should be 0 0.708 and it's written here. And I'll tell you why I'm saying it should be 0 0.708 and not 0 0.7. Uh, so these two are for reliability, which is your construct reliability and indicator reliability. Then you have validity. Now validity, uh, one thing you must have heard of it, AVE, average variance extracted. It should be higher than 0 0.5. Again, I'm going to explain why it should be higher than 0 0.5 on the next slide. Uh, and then discriminate uh, validity. Traditionally, people would use uh, Fornell and Lecker criterion. Uh, but with introduction of PLS, there was another tool which was cross loadings. And in 2015, end of 2015, um, there's another tool which is called HTMT criteria. It's a new tool. Uh, and it's based on simulations. Some scholars related to PLS, they came up with this uh, new tool to assess discriminant validity. And their justification for this was because Fornell and Lecker is very old. They didn't consider a lot of things and they have a lot of miscrepancies. So they ran a lot of simulations and at the end they decided that HTMT criteria is a very uh, well-deserving discriminant validity uh, tool to be used by the researchers. Um, so. All right. Now, why I was saying that we should use AVE more than 0 0.5 and why should we use the loadings or whatever, here is a, a very quick explanation of this. So let's say we have this Y1, which is your construct, and then X1, X2, X3 are the items to measure this construct, right? So whenever we have these items, we want to make sure that each of this item is actually capturing the data for Y1, which is your construct, right? Now, uh, this one, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.9, these are the loadings for each of this item. And we have to make sure that this loading actually is the correlation between the item and the construct. Okay, so correlation means that these are related and higher correlation uh, coefficient would show you that these are highly related. As I said, it's a reflective construct. They should be highly correlated. And since they are really highly correlated, it, it shows that, you know, whatever the value for X1 is, it's actually capturing the data for Y1, okay? And uh, a logical explanation is that, think about it, if you are measuring something through an item, you never want a correlation below 0 0.5 or 0 0.6. A rule of thumb is that at least we need 70% of the variance uh, captured in the main construct should be through this item, right? So, and then all these three, uh, all together, like whatever is the square of correlation for this, for X2 and X3, these are the uh, values. So let's say for 0 0.60, uh, 0, if we take the square root, uh, square of it, we get 0 0.36. For 0 0.70, we get the square root of 0 0.49. And for 0 0.90, the square is 0 0.81. So these are the squares of these uh, loadings. And if you take an average of these three, that would be 0 0.55. So this is your AVE. So AVE, as the name suggests, is average variance extracted. So it means that all these three items uh, actually explain 55% of this construct. This is what AVE is. Now, for loadings, you must have seen in the literature, people say that loading should be higher than 0 0.7, right? The problem with that is that if your loading is 0 0.7 and then you take a square of it, then you get a value of 0 0.49. So assume if you have loading for X1, X2, and X3, for all three, if you have a loading of 0 0.70, which according to literature is okay. So if you have 0 0.70 for X1, 0 0.70 for X2, and 0 0.70 for X3, so the average would be 0 0.70. And then when you take a square, your AVE would be 0 0.49. Now think about it. Literature says that loading should be 0 0.7 and AVE should be 0 0.5. Now if you consider 0 0.7 an accurate measure, your AVE would be 0 0.49, which is not good. So that is why I have mentioned here that your indicator reliability should be higher than 0 0.708. Because if you take an and a square of 0 0.708, it would be exactly 0 0.5, which is your AVE. So sometimes in literature, there are these problems. Now, when I say your loading should be higher than 0 0.708, it does not mean that all of them have to be. Because in some cases, you the loadings for X3 might be 0 0.9 or 0 0.8. So that covers up that small difference. 
okay but in case where your loadings are all below 0 0.7 uh, 0 0.708 in that case your AVE would not be higher than 0 0.5 so that is one thing you need to make sure about um, so uh, this is how the discriminant validity table looks like it's normally a correlation table right a correlation table and then we have the AVE value which goes on the top uh, we take a square root of AVE, it should be higher than all these other values in that row and in that column. Uh, that's uh, how it is. Now, sometimes if you have a single item construct, you cannot take a square root of single item construct because if it's a single item construct, you do not have average variance expected. Average is always for more than one thing. So if you have a construct with one item, whatever that loading is, that would be your AVE. So that's why I have mentioned here single item construct and not AVE. And if you have formative, again, for formative, as I said, there's no correlation between formative uh, uh, constructs, formative items. That is why you do not have AVE and that is why I have mentioned here formative instead of AVE. So this is how your discriminant validity should look like. In PLS, there's another uh, aspect which is called cross loadings. And if you look here on the top, ATTR, COMP, these are all different variables. And on this other side, like on your uh, vertical line, you can see ATTR1, ATTR2, ATTR3. These are the items for each of this concept. So what the, the whole thing here is that these three items like ATTR1, 2, and 3, the loadings for these three should be higher than all the other numbers in this row or in this column. This simply means that these three items only load on this variable. So this shows that it's discriminant, uh, it's fulfilling discriminant validity. Okay, so I covered this thing. I'm gonna go into Smart PLS interface now and show you how can we model this very fast. Um, and you will get an idea of how the interface looks like. So here I have this one model that's about supply chain management. And this model simply shows that if you have different variables such as like the usage of, uh, usage of information technology tools, if you have commitment and if you have trust, uh, you will do the sharing of information. And if you share information, your manufacturing performance will increase. So this is what this model simply means. Uh, so if I go into, if I, okay, if I go into Smart PLS, I am going to show you how to do all this. Okay, so here is how it looks like. So this is the interface for Smart PLS. Um, I'm just trying to see if I can move this sidebar here. Okay, yeah, so this is how the Smart PLS interface looks like. Um, I'm gonna start it uh, from scratch so that you know how can we use all these things. Okay, so um, I hope everybody can see it now. So this is how the interface looks like. So whenever you start Smart PLS, right? And that's easy. If you go to smartpls.com, you can see you can download this. Again, just to clarify, uh, Smart PLS is a paid software, so you have to purchase your license. But if you want to get it, like you can get a 30-day free trial. So you can go download it and use it for 30 days. And if you like it, you can go ahead and you know get the license. Uh, for academics, faculty, or students, you can also get a 50% discount, which is all on the website, so you can look into that. But once you install it and um, you turn on the Smart PLS application, this is how this interface looks like. So the first one here, if you look at this, this is your project explorer, and you can see all your projects here, okay? Whatever projects you develop, it would be here. This is your main, uh, main pane, and then, it's extremely simple. So you click on new project. Let's say I click on it and I develop a project called SCM webinar. So I 
turn it on and then if you look here in project explorer here i got something called scm webinar which is my a new project I just developed and if you look here is a red error mark in this which simply means that there's something wrong now and what's wrong is it says by itself double click to import data so you have to import data by double clicking it so once you double click it obviously it's going to bring you into your Windows file explorer to pick up a data file and put it in now remember that whenever you are importing data you cannot import a SPSS file or any other type of file uh, into smart PLS it always picks up a CSV format which is in Excel so if you have a data file in SPSS you can save as go to file save as CSV if you have an Excel data file still you can go to save as and then you can see a CSV um, extension in the file saving types and you can save it as CSV and that's how it can save once you save it as CSV and you can look at here, all these files are um, saved as comma separated values, which is CSV. And you can pick up something from here to um, go ahead with it. So uh, let me just go to, so here is SCM. So I'm gonna take this one, um, it's imported. So now once I imported it, you can see in this project explorer that red error term is gone which means that you do not have any problem now. Now, what they did in this new version of Smart PLS is they made it really, really easy for people. So once you have it, you can see all the things here, which, what I was talking about. So here you can see a column for missing values. So you can see there's no missing values, zero, 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 because it's a clean data file, we have cleaned it up. And you can see all the variables is in this data. You can see the mean, median, minimum, maximum, all these things. But what's very interesting here is that they've also included uh, kurtosis and skewness, where you can see that if your data is normally distributed or non, not normally distributed. So you can see all those things here, which is very, very good thing to be um, providing here. Like you don't have to go to SPSS to all those things. You can do them right here in SPS uh, Smart PLS. So here, you once you look at your data, it looks clean, it looks good, uh, fine. You just close this tab. It's done, we are done with the data, it's good. But now we come back to Project Explorer and you can see here under SCM webinar, we have two things. So one is this SCM 116 record, which shows your data file. So if you click on this, you can go back again to the, the same data view which we had. Um, and the other one, if you look at here, it, it's something like a UFO or an alien, but it's, it's basically this blue, oval and yellow items are showing that you can develop your model here so if you click on this you come to some place where you will feel like you are an artist or something and this is what i love about smart PL is that it's so user intuitive and user friendly uh, interface with this uh, application and it's extremely easy extremely easy to develop uh, a model here and if we go back very quickly to the model which we are uh, going to develop here i'm going to show it to you and then Um, okay. okay, so here is a model which uh, I'm going to make. Um, if anybody wants, you can take a picture of it so that when I'm making it, you don't lose your sight of this model. But it's extremely easy. You can see there are a few ovals and uh, some stuff. So I'm going to make this model really, really quick on uh, Smart PLS, and I'll show you how you can also make it. So, um, okay, so I come back to the screen, and what I can do is I can decrease this one so that we have a better place to develop this model very easy you don't have many many things here like you know adobe photoshop or anything it's very easy you have select zoom in zoom out you have latent variable connect and that's it there are some other things but those are we are going to talk about them later right now uh, in that model we had five variables so i'm going to click on latent variable and then i just click five times here so i have five variables right so i i, I get the select tool I can make them in line to make them look beautiful. If you want, you can even make it even better. And how you can do it is by clicking on grid here on this side. So you have the grid. I mean, if you are really particular about making things in line and really, really in line, then you can use grid. If you don't want to use grid, you can use snap. And then 
what snap does is it brings this blue line just to make sure that you are in line so again it, it's making it really easy to uh, develop your models very beautifully those of you who have used amos uh, when i was using amos i was really really upset with the user interface and it's really really difficult so now what we do is we quickly rename these models uh, you right click you go to rename you rename them let's say it was IP use and then it was commitment and then we hit trust share and the last one is manufacturing performance so when we have once we have named all our variables then we have to put the items right so when you have your model you know which items goes where so for instance now once we have all these variables what are we going to do is if you look here below this project explorer you will see indicators so all your indicators are here right so let's say for it use we have four indicators all of them are here like it internet it ept it dw it SEM. what you do is you click on the first one hold shift click on the last one you select all four you just drag and drop them okay for trust here are three of them i dr click and drop drag and drop for commitment and then we have for share and then we have for manufacturing performance now once i did it it looks a bit ugly because all of them are you know facing the same side so what i do is like for this share i want it to go down so i just click on it and like on this one side if you look we have all these colors and different things here we have align so i click on align below I click on a line on side and it looks beautiful. Now the thing is that all your variables are looking red. Remember whenever they are red it means there is something wrong with your model. Like there is some sort of thing because of which the model do not will not be uh, able to run. And from what I can see here the problem here is that we did not draw hypothesis. So what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on connect. I connect here to here, here to here, here and that's it. Boom. You have all of them as blue, which means now your model is error free. So this is how you're going to make your model. Once this is done, uh, it's all you have already done like 60% of your SEM. Okay. Now what we do is, as I said, first of all, we do the measurement model because we need to make sure that uh, this variable and these items are all good. Okay. So uh, you look at this calculate, you go click on calculate. And then the first one is PLS algorithm. Since we are using PLS, we need to click on PLS algorithm and start calculation. Done. This is all your results. So if you look here, you have different tabs. Go back to this SCM webinar and you will see you have all these numbers which show all your loadings. And these are all your path coefficients. And the values inside this uh, variable this shows you R square because that's your prediction based uh, modeling. So this is how it is. There are a lot of other things you can do. For instance, if you want to see which of these hypotheses is the highest one, what you can do is here, uh, I'm not going to go into that. That's going to confuse you and that's like graphical stuff. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly finish other things. So once you have all these things, um, then you need uh, to report them. Right now, how do we report them is uh, like this. Uh, so let's say we have this one paper and I'm going to share this paper with you people. So here is a paper which is uh, which was recently published in tourism management and we have used PLS. So uh, here is how you are going to report them. So you have your construct here. And then you have all the items and then you have your loadings AVE and composite reliability. So these loadings AVE and com so now what we need is we need all the loadings. We need AVE and we need composite reliability. So we go back to uh, PLS. And uh, so we have all of them. What we need to do is we click on this tab PLS algorithm. All our results are here, here in the lower section. So if we look here on the final results, you will see outer loadings. Now remember why we call them outer loadings? Because here is our model. All these lines inside the model, these are inner model. All the lines outside these blue circles, these are outer model. 
right? So we go back to outer loadings, we click on outer loadings, and here we got all of our loadings. So it's extremely easy. Uh, you can clip to uh, copy to clipboard on Excel. You can go to any Excel sheet. Uh, let's say we go to Excel. Here we are in Excel and we copy paste it. So here is our, here are all our variables, here are all our loadings. So all we need to do is copy and cut and paste them here. So here we are, um, you can name your variables here, commitment, ITUs. I'm not gonna go into all of it, but this is how you can do it for all of them. So here you have all your variables and then your items, you can name it as constructs, items, loadings. So we can cover all of this like this. Uh, we have all our loadings and everything. Now for loadings, I said we need to make sure that all of them are over 0 0.708. So you can see all of them are okay, except for some of them. IT use, um, two of them, one of them is okay, two of them are okay, two are not okay. Uh, so this is how it is. These are all your loadings. If some of them are not good, you can delete them. But remember, you can't delete a lot of them. Uh, a rule of thumb is that you can only delete 20% of the items. You can't delete more than that. So these are your loadings for um, for other stuff. For other stuff, what we can do is uh, okay. Once we have loadings, the second thing we have AVE and composite reliability. Again, here below, like in this part, you can see here. Uh, you will find other things such as discriminant validity, construct reliability and validity. So we talked about it, we go to construct reliability and validity and we can look at here, we have Kronbach Alpha here, Kronbach Alpha and then we have composite reliability and then we have AVE. So we pick up all these values, we can pick up all these values and then we can go uh, back to our paper uh, and you can report all these values AVE, uh, and, and composite reliability. So you report them like this. The next stage, what we talked about is whenever you are doing uh, SEM, discriminant validity, which is your correlation uh, table, and then the square root, uh, the square of AVE should be higher, the square root of AVE should be higher than all the coefficient of correlations. A smart PLS does it easy again for you. You don't have to do any calculations. If you go back to smart PLS, here is the indicator. You click on this discriminant validity here, you click on it and here is your table. So all you need to do is just copy this table and paste it in Excel. And here you are with all your variables on both the sides. You just have to do one thing and that thing is to make bold, make these values bold, which shows that these values are higher than all the other values. So this is your discriminant validity. Now, once you are done with discriminant validity, in the paper, we can see that uh, once it's done, then we have our structural model or our hypothesis testing. Again, extremely simple. Uh, we come back to this model. We are done with measurement model, but for structural model, again, as I said, this is a non-parametric test. So what we do is we use bootstrapping method what is bootstrapping method? That's again deep in statistics. I'm not going to explain what it is, but I'm just going to show you how you can do that. So you again click on calculate just like PLS algorithm and you will see here bootstrapping. If you click on bootstrapping and you start calculating, so it's gonna take a five, six seconds. Once you did it, here you get your table. The first screen you get this table, you copy it, you paste it on let's say Excel once you paste it on Excel, what you need to do is just keep the first column and the last two columns. So you delete the these two columns from here, you get them. So the first one is actually your coefficient, the second one is your T value, and the third one is your T value or significance value. So if you look at the first column, you will see the hypothesis, which is commitment, 
uh, effect of commitment on sharing, IT use on sharing, sharing on manufacturing performance and trust on sharing. So these are all your path coefficients. You can see all of them are okay except for the last one which is a negative value. And then you have to look at your p-values and we all know that in order to support any hypothesis, we have to say that the p-value should be lower than 0 0.05. So here if you look the first three, you have p-values lower than 0 0.05 so you can support these hypotheses. And the last one since it's higher than 0 0.05, that one can be, uh, that one can be actually uh, rejected, uh, that hypothesis or not supported. So. Uh, so this is how it is. I'm going back to uh, Smart PLS screen, which is here. And uh, so uh, this is a very basic uh, example of how you can do these things. We are short of time, so I cannot show you more stuff because we have just a couple of minutes left. So except for these things, one other thing which you have to report in structural model, that's your R square. And since we talked that PLS is a predictive or prediction based uh, SEM method. So again, in these findings here in lower end, you click on R square and you will see that you have only, um, sorry, if you, um, once you do the PLS loadings, you will see that the values which are inside this model here, these are your R squares. So for sharing it's 34.5%, for manufacturing performance is 15.4%. So as I said, uh, since our focus is on prediction here, here you can see that you have both these R squares. Um, and for R squares, a uh, basic rule of thumb is that it should be higher than 0.1%, which is 10% of the entire variance. Again, some people say it should be higher than 40% in order to make your model somewhat meaningful. So that's very basic smart PLS analysis, like this is how you develop your model, you run your measurement model, you run your structural model. I wish we had more time to explain even further like how to do formative constructs or how to do mediation and believe me that's on my PowerPoint slides and I was going to talk about them but because we are short of time and it's really difficult to explain the entire software and the entire PLS operations in one and a half hour and you people can understand that. So I don't know, we are going to talk to see if we can do another webinar to look into the advanced statistics using PLS. Um, but um, yeah, so that's it. I'm going to look into the questions very quickly. What are the questions and see if we can answer them really fast. Also, Dr. Ali, that it looks like that your screen, smart PLS screen, uh -huh. uh, cannot be viewed by some viewers, audience. Okay. So we can see it here. I don't know, maybe there is a little bit technical thing here. Maybe, we yes. But we will e uh, email everybody the recorded webinar, so that should hopefully uh, be captured as we record this and you, you should you should be able to see it there. We apologize for that one. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to very quickly, um, um, okay, so those of you who did not, who are not able to see the smart PLS, maybe some technical issues, but you will be able to see the recordings. One person asked about the model fit indices in M, like MOS does have it and uh, PLS does not have it. So just for your clarification, PLS does offer model fit indices it's not as established as AMOS, but they do have it. One of them is called GOF statistic, which is called goodness of fit statistic. And then recently there's another statistic which is introduced in 2016 called SRMR theta, which is standardized root for mean squares, something like this, which is a theta. And that's available for smart PLS as a model fit in this. So if you have any questions from editors or reviewers, you can use those two statistics to show that your model was fit. Um, uh, so, okay. Then one person asked if I can provide an example of formative measurement model. Since the time is really short, I cannot do that. But again, we are going to discuss this, me and Dr. Jehan, to see if we can do another webinar for one and a half hour to only focus on advanced statistics like formative uh, statistic, formative constructs, mediation, moderation, and stuff like that. Um, okay, uh, yes, now one person said the model in the PPT shows formative as well as reflective, but here I did it for reflective only, and yes, that was on purpose because I first wanted to show how to do reflective, and I was thinking to do formative, but short of time, we couldn't do that. Uh, PLS is very good to use, be used for scale development. You can use that because when you develop a scale, your study is more or less exploratory in nature, so you can do that. 
Uh, one other person asked, we can, can we use single items? Yes, I have said you can use single item constructs and you can also use demographic questions in your model such as gender or age, you can do that. Um, uh, okay. Uh, I'm talking about if PLS can be used smart PLS in a Mac. Yeah, I was just looking at that. Yes, you can use that on Mac and smart PLS have a wonderful, wonderful responsive customer care team. So if you have any problem while you are using it, you can always message them and they'll get back to you within 24 hours. My experience is that. Another question here, can you add single items such as gender or age? Yes, yeah. we can um, We can um, add single item constructs, gender, age, and that's one justification for using PLS, so you can do that. Um, all right, and uh, what else? Yes, again, uh, one person asked, is 10% sample of the population recommended? It's somewhere in the literature, it's not recommended based on the fact that you do not have justification to say whether this 10% is representative of the population or not. Because when we take sample, it is not based on percentage, it's always based on how representative is your sample. So even if you have 5% of your population and it's well representing the population, makes sense. But even if you have like 50% of your sample, population as the sample, but it's half of the 50% is not representing the whole population, it won't make any sense. Uh, how to conduct CFA using PLS? Uh, so the item loadings I showed just now, how to record the item loadings, that was CFA, and that's how you can use CFA using PLS. Um, yes, you can use this approach for longitudinal studies. Um, okay, and then the last question, which was the difference among SEM vector autoregressive model and VEC, uh, I would say if you can provide your email address, I'm going to email you in detail on all these differences because we have. And, we, are, and we do have that. Uh, we know who asked that question. Yeah, so I'm going to email you with your answers, and if you want, you can email me back with if you have any questions. For and, all the other respondents, if you have any questions about anything related to PLS, please uh, do send email to me or to Dr. Jehan and we'll make sure that we Dr. Nadi, can you please bring our, uh, uh, the PowerPoint, the contact information is there as the uh, Okay, yes, sure, sure. And somebody asked if we can get the PPT, somebody joined late. Uh, we will email that shortly to you along with the recorded uh, one. But if we go into the last uh, slide here, we have our contact information. And this is the website address there, uh, conference.ane.org slash webinar. Uh, maybe in a few hours that we'll be able to put all these materials here. Like Dr. Ali mentioned, there are some articles that we also recommend you to read. We will also put the links there as well. So you will be able to get all of them. Uh, his email and my email address is there. Feel free to email to us. We got a lot of thank you. I, uh, I just want to add one more thing, sorry, Dr. Jehan, before we hung up, and that's uh, Smart PLS has two versions. One was Smart PLS version two, which is free of cost. You can download it. Uh, it's free completely if you don't have to pay anything, but again, it's not, it's, it's very user friendly, but it's not like Smart PLS three. You can't see a lot of stuff which Smart PLS three does. And then again, it, there's no support available for that version. So if you want to just use it, you can even download Smart PLS version two. You can use that. But Smart PLS three, it has a lot of functionality. So, but you have to pay for that. And you can also check with your university. Sometimes universities have the licenses. Sometimes even other colleges have the licenses. So you can use them on your campus as well. Uh, somebody asked, is Smart PLS the best software for PLS SEM? For now, yes, because of its user interface and ease of running the analysis, it's one, uh, I won't say it's the best because it's again a sweeping statement. My experience and a lot of other experts who are really expert in statistics, they all feel that Smart PLS is a breakthrough in uh, modeling, in structural equation modeling. Dr. Ali, thank you so much. You have done a wonderful, great webinar. Uh, I also would like to thank all of you who have uh, joined today. Unfortunately, our license was 100 people. I know that we maxed that out today. Hopefully, those of you who couldn't attend will be able to send this uh, recording to you. Thanks again. We'll be able to get back. And uh, thank you to all who are uh, texting us. Great uh, thanks messages. We appreciate it. So have a wonderful day, afternoon, night, uh, depending on where you are. 
Uh, hopefully we'll see you in future webinars later again from the Association of North America Higher Education International. Uh, last but not least, I would like to thank University of South Florida, Sarasota Manatee, College of Hospitality, Tourism Leadership for sponsoring this webinar. Have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Goodbye.